Nichols. The subcommittee will now come to order. We're meeting today to consider some 15 bills. These bills ban asbestos, regulate pair and polyfluoroalkyl substances, and provide for storage of nuclear waste. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today, the subcommittee will hold its first markup of the 116th Congress. This agenda includes 15 bills reflecting the work done through our oversight and legislative hearings during the first half of the year. This includes H.R. 1603, the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act of 2019, which would take the long overdue step of banning asbestos in the United States. We have heard the importance of this bill from workers, from firefighters, and families that have suffered from asbestos-related diseases. I do not believe anyone here wants asbestos to continue to be imported and used in our country. This bill would have us follow the lead of more than 60 countries that have moved forward with bans because despite our best efforts decades ago, Americans are still living with asbestos in an untold number of buildings and what is worse, purchasing crayons, makeup, and other products that contain asbestos. This is, an un is unacceptable and it must end as quickly as possible. So I do thank uh, Representative Shimkus, our ranking member for the subcommittee, and the minority staff for being willing to work with us on this bill. This is the way the process is meant to work. We heard a handful of concerns at our legislative hearing, and we have continued to discuss how we might be able to address them in a way that is acceptable to both sides as well as almost every interested stakeholder. I am hopeful that we can reach an agreement on changes to the text before full committee. We will also consider 13 bills that take a variety of steps to respond to the emerging and growing environmental and public health threat of per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, commonly known as PFAS. These chemicals are persistent in the environment, incredibly toxic, and dangerous to human health, even in very small concentrations. We are still learning the full extent of the dangers, but PFAS exposure has been linked to kidney disease, thyroid dysfunction, and various forms of cancer. These bills cross numerous statutes within our jurisdiction, including the Safe Drinking Water Act, Superfund, TSCA, and the Clean Air Act. Collectively, these bills would do a lot of good to reduce Americans' exposure to PFAS through our air, our water, and our consumer products. They include increasing testing, promoting consumer awareness, and ensuring disclosure, treatment, and remediation when PFAS is released into or found in the environment. Dealing with PFAS contamination has been a tragic experience in my home area of upstate New York. I know that it is also true for an increasing number of community, communities across our great country. I hope we can respond in a way that either prevents other communities and individuals from having to go through this or at least gives them the legal tools to respond robustly. I am also all too aware that a number of PFAS provisions were included in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, which is currently being negotiated by a conference committee. We know how our colleagues in the Senate operate. We know they stick provisions on non-germane bills. If the NDAA is their vehicle for getting PFAS legislation enacted, I am open to those discussions, but that should not be an excuse for us not to also move bills in the House through the Committee of Jurisdiction and through regular order. I will also note that some of the bills being considered today are outside the scope of that negotiation, and I hope we can continue to work to find common ground where possible to uh, advance a meaningful PFAS package through this com uh, committee. Finally, H.R. 2699, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2019, was introduced by Congress members McNearney and ranking, uh, and ranking member Shimkus. This bill builds on the hard work done last year under Mr. Shimkus' leadership. In the 115th Congress, a very similar bill passed this committee by some 49 to 4. We know nuclear waste issues are politically challenging, but it is an important responsibility of this subcommittee to continue to work to solve. I want to thank my colleagues for their efforts to assist communities dealing with waste and protect taxpayers from the need to make even more payments from the Treasury. I hope we can report all these bills today and, where possible, continue negotiating before full committee to reach bipartisan agreement. And with that, I yield back and now recognize uh, Representative Shimkus, Ranking Member of the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change, for five minutes, sir, for an opening statement, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me to speak for our first subcommittee markup of this Congress. The subcommittee's agenda for today is ambitious, and I appreciate the conversations we have had prior to the markup to make today a more manageable and productive experience for all our members of the subcommittee. Today, we will endeavor to work together where we can, agree to disagree where we must, but always be civil and respectful of each other and our views. The first bill we consider, which, which I know is a priority of Chairman Pallone, is the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act. I think we can work together on this bill to get to a good place, and I want to get to a yes on it if we can. As I mentioned at the legislative hearing on this bill, Madison County, Illinois, which I represent here in Congress, has the greatest amount of asbestos litigation filed before it than any other jurisdiction in the country. I believe the majority and minority staffs have had productive discussions on this bill and understand things are moving in a good direction. I look forward to hopefully congratulating my colleagues on the deal we have found when this bill is considered in full committee. The Baker dozens of bills on parafluoroalkali and polyfluoroalkali substances are a bit trickier group. Um, just to start, uh, uh, some questions that I still have is do we even know how many different formulations of PFAS are actually out in our society? And has Congress ever specifically designated a substance or a chemical anything else as a hazardous substance before? Have we ever done that? Those are just two general questions um, that I, I'm still troubled with. As I mentioned at the legislative hearing, it seems a big departure from regular scientific review and practice to just start banning, regulating, and otherwise limiting potential thousands of substances without the appropriate scientific due diligence having been done. It does concern me that with all the PFAS legislation flying around the Capitol, the Environmental Protection Agency has yet to testify on the record about the advisability or feasibility of any of these bills, allowing members to ask about alternatives. That said, I am aware some informal technical comments have been sent to anyone who has asked for them, so there is some understanding of what these bills may do. Based upon that, in the PFAS space, I think it is reasonable that we can get to a good place on both the full committee's chairman's bill and the former full committee chairman's bill. Uh, Mr. Pallone's bill also seeks to help drinking water systems that are having trouble treating PFAS in their drinking water to obtain grants for that purposes. Mr. Upton's bill will drive cooperative agreements between federal government and defense department and the state to ensure the federal government cleans up contamination to the to the lower of federal or state standards. I also think it is reasonable that we can get to a good place on H.R. 2638 and H.R. 2566, authorizing the issuance of firefighting foam guidance and labels for cookware about whether they contain PFAS. Um, finally, while I cannot support it as drafted today, I'm committed to working with you on H.R. 2608, a bill to get appropriate toxicity testing information into EPA's, EPA's hands so that we can be informed about the real and not supposed risk of these chemicals. I'm also um, open to continuing discussions on the incineration uh, bill that we talked about uh, yesterday. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Chairman, many of the PFAS bills are not ones I can see agreement as something that will happen easily or soon. At the appropriate time, I will go into the reasons. We will also consider H.R. 2699, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act Amendments of 2019, which Mr. McNerney is leading this Congress. The bill reflects a considerable work on this committee to establish a workable path to restart the yucca license processing while maintaining permanent disposal as a cornerstone of our national policy. This bill reflects a, the bipartisan compromise to authorize the Department of Energy to move forward with the temporary storage program and to contract with a private company for this purpose. This new policy approach resulted from the thoughtful interactions with members in the last Congress, including my good friend, Ms. Matsui of California. The new policy approach addresses their concerns about more rapidly removing stranded nuclear waste while maintaining linkage to completing the safety license process for a permanent repository. We must remember that Congress established this process in law to address the national priority for disposing of nuclear waste and is the only way we can address interim concerns. I look forward to moving this bill today. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it's going to be a good day. We've got a lot of work to do, and, and thank you for being open and accessible. And with that, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. And thank you, Mr. Shimkus, for your willingness to work on the Baker's dozen of PFAS bills. Um, I like the rhetoric. Um, I now recognize uh, Representative Pallone, Chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for an opening statement. 
Thank you, Chairman Tonko. Today's markup is a significant step forward in this subcommittee's ongoing efforts to address serious threats to communities nationwide. The 15 bills before us represent the hard work of many of my colleagues, and I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to move them forward today. It's been more than 40 years since the EPA first began working to ban asbestos, but today will mark the first vote in the House on legislation that would finally ban asbestos for good. And I want to thank Representatives Bonamici and Slotkin for working with me on the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act of 2019. This ban is long overdue, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to work to get it enacted. We'll also consider 13 bills to address PFAS contamination, which is affecting communities all around the nation. These are persistent toxic chemicals that spread through our water, air, and soil. These bills are an opportunity for us to take bold action to address this serious environmental problem. Given what we already know about these forever chemicals, we must act now to stop the flow of these chemicals into our environment and our bodies. I want to thank Representatives Dingle, Soto, Custer, and Upton on our committee, and Representatives Dean, Delgado, Stevens, Kana, Fletcher, Ruta, and Maloney for their leadership on these bills. These bills will stem the flow of new PFAS into commerce, contain contaminated sites, empower consumers, protect drinking water, and protect air quality. Individually, they're important. Together, they offer our communities the tools they need to combat this growing environmental problem. I had hoped at this point that members of the committee on both sides of the aisle would have come together to hammer out any needed changes to the PFAS and asbestos bills. Unfortunately, we're, we're not there yet but I am committed to continuing to work with my colleagues to find consensus as these bills move forward, and I urge all of my colleagues to join me in forwarding these critical public health protections to the full committee to demonstrate we are taking real strides to protect the health and safety of our communities. And lastly, we'll consider legislation to address our nation's nuclear waste problem, H.R. 2699, introduced by Representative McNearney and Ranking Member Shimkus. This bill is similar to H.R. 3053 from the 115th Congress, which this committee reported out by a vote of 49 to 4, and then passed the House with broad bipartisan support. And I want to thank Representative McNeerney for his leadership on this issue, but also appreciate that Ranking Member Shimkus, when he chaired this subcommittee in the prior Congress, worked with us in good faith to address our concerns and incorporate interim storage language authored by Representative Matsui, and thank Representative Matsui for her work on the interim storage issue, as many others. Communities across the country are expressing frustration as more and more nuclear plants close, but there is no real national solution to moving the spent fuel to a centralized interim storage facility or permanent repository. Whether it's a general safety concern or the desire of the community to redevelop the land currently housing the spent fuel, it's critical that we find a path forward to begin the process of moving nuclear waste out of these communities. So again, thank all the members for the work on these bills today and look forward to moving them to the full committee soon. I don't know if anybody wants my time, but I, I guess you don't need it uh, at this point, so I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We thank Chairman Pallone. I now recognize Representative Walden, ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for an opening statement, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate uh, all the work you and, and Mr. Shimkus are doing on these bills, leading uh, the subcommittee's efforts. We really do appreciate it. I know we've got an aggressive and, and very full agenda today, and really these are important issues for all of our members and, and for the citizens of America. Today, we're considering a bill that's, uh, to close the book on environmental problems of the past, bills to address environmental problems of the present, and a bill to avoid environmental problems long into the future. Now, the first bill I'd like to address is H.R. 1603. That's the one that bans manufacture, import, processing, and movement in commerce of asbestos and mixtures and articles containing asbestos. Not only do I know that this bill is important to uh, my colleague, Ms. Bonamici, and to our senator in Oregon, Senator Merkley, uh, from my home state, but I know it's also a big priority for the chairman of the committee. I support the intent of the legislation, but as I mentioned at the subcommittee hearing, I, I have a few concerns about implementation of this legislation and how some of these standards will be interpreted. So I just want to get that, those issues resolved uh, between here and full. I appreciate and I thank the chairman of the full and subcommittee for their courtesies in working with us on this bill. Our talks have been very productive. I think staffs have made real progress in negotiating a compromise uh, to get to the best language possible. And while we're not there yet, we are getting close, I believe, and I, I think we will be able to get something that will address concerns that many people have voiced about asbestos. 
The second set of bills scheduled for today relates to highly fluorinate chemicals. I know your experience in New York, Mr. Chairman, as well as the experiences in Michigan and North Carolina um, have driven intense interest in preventing and addressing PFAS contamination. In Oregon, the Air National Guard at Kingsley Field in Klamath Falls, my districts use foam with PFAS to fight fires, as well as two other sites in the state, and we do find some contamination levels there. So I want to work to address the concerns about the uncertainties that PFAS presents. The test for me in addressing PFAS contamination is not the number of bills we pass, rather it is whether the response we provide can be reasonable, reliable, and responsible remediation um, efforts that get help to people sooner rather than later and without detours to the courthouse. We need a common sense approach that can become law and that works. Finally, let me turn to H.R. 2699, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2019. Mr. Chairman, this legislation reflects how this committee does work together on thoughtful policy, including in complex areas, and remain focused on sound science and the national interest. As we all know, the federal government's been unable to complete the uh, safety licensing process for a permanent repository at Yucca Mountain. It costs the American taxpayer to pay for the federal government's delay in opening the Yucca Mountain repository have more than doubled to $35 billion since 2009, and that figure continues to escalate rapidly as time goes on. This is a very expensive delay. We also know how a thoughtful and deliberative legislative process produces good legislation. This is reflected in H.R. 2699, led by Mr. McNerney, which follows closely the text developed in H.R. 3053 from the last Congress, led by my friend and the longtime champion of this issue, John Shimkus. In fact, if we do this, I think we ought to rename Yucca Mountain to Shimkus Hill or something. I don't know. McNerney Mountain. McNerney Mountain. There you go. The bill would accelerate the interim storage of waste without undermining the important system for permanent disposal established in the underlying law. This represents the best path forward for getting the nation to a decision on safety licensing, which is necessary for the public understanding of the science and engineering behind the Yucca site and the confidence in our nuclear waste program. Ensuring the safe disposal of high-level radioactive waste is critical for the public health and maintaining the many important benefits of nuclear energy in the nation, so I urge support. And, uh, you know, I'll be uh, going up to Hanford at some time in the near future. It's really important that we get a permanent repository so we can take this nuclear waste, get it glassified, get it put in a safe and secure location. And so I, I really appreciate your moving forward on, on this issue. We had a big vote in the House last Congress, and I anticipate we will again. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, and we thank Representative Walden. Uh, do other members seek recognition to make an opening statement? Uh, the uh, chair recognizes Representative Clark for three minutes for an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, Ranking Member Shimkus for convening this important markup on PFAS, asbestos, and nu nuclear waste legislation. PFAS contamination is a national issue that requires our immediate attention. I'm very thankful that the water system in my district in Brooklyn has been spared from contamination. But for too long, many communities throughout New York State, many of them low-income communities and communities of color, PFAS contamination has poisoned their water supply and has caused significant long-term health impacts, especially for women and children. Asbestos has also been a major source of toxic contamination throughout the country. Last year, an underground steam pipe exploded in New York City, filling the air with toxic asbestos fibers and forcing the evacuation of surrounding buildings and streets. According to the New York City Commissioner for Emergency Management, the major issue was not so much the explosion, but more so the contamination that ensued and the hundreds of bystanders and firefighters who needed to be immediately decontaminated. I look forward to voting on these bills and to passing legislation that will protect the lives of millions of our constituents across the United States. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members who seek recognition for uh, an opening statement. The uh, chair recognizes uh, Representative Peters for three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do want to say that California, like many, many other states, has set drinking water notification limits for PFAS, but has not yet ab adopted standards. As we continue to make progress on the federal standard setting pro process, 
I hope we can keep in mind some of the feedback I've received from constituents and water agencies alike. In California, there's only one lab run by a public water agency that, that's certified to test for 18 types of PFAS. Therefore, it's essential we provide adequate funding for our community water systems to comply with new federal standards. On this, I commend Char Chairman Pallone for introducing uh, H.R. 2533, Providing Financial S Assistance for Safe Drinking Water Act, which provides funding to help water systems pay for costs associated with remediation technologies. Second, the costs of cleanup are high, and right now we are, they are borne by water agencies and often passed on to taxpayer ratepayers. We have to ensure that the entities contaminating the groundwater supplies remain liable for costs associated with remediation. And on this, I commend Representative Ruda, who in, introduced the PFAS User Fee Act to hold polluters liable for ongoing water treatment costs. And third, while many companies are phasing out uh, products that contain PFAS, we're still importing PFAS chemicals for new uses. And on this, I commend Madeline Dean, or Representative Madeline Dean, who introduced H.R. 2600, the Toxic PFAS Control Act, that will ban all PFAS from importation. I want to thank all of my colleagues for their hard work, um, and they may be called forever chemicals, but I'm optimistic that at this clip they won't be around forever. Um, and maybe I'd also take some time to talk about the nuclear issues now. As many of you know, the San Onofre nuclear generating station is just outside of my district, and what happens to the spent nuclear fuel as it decommissions matters greatly to my constituents. I have long supported federal efforts for both interim storage, both interim storage and a permanent disposal site in order to consolidate the fuel that is affecting my constituents and other communities around the country. I supported this bill last Congress, and I support it now, even as I know we can make some amendments to make it better. We need to allow both interim storage and a permanent disposal site at Yucca Mountain to advance simultaneously. This August, uh, I went to see the site at Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and I think all members should see it in order to address any concerns that they have. For hours, uh, I and my colleagues asked questions about the process for site selection and was encouraged by the scientific and legal footing on which the Yucca site stands, starting with 10 site options, narrowing down to three, and finally to one, this site was chosen uh, based on facts around seismology, geological acceptability, a 1,600-foot natural butter bu buffer from water contamination, and many more. And it's located on the same range where th this country performed nuclear detonations before. I know it is of concern to um, our friends in, in Nevada. I think we should take that seriously. But I also know that this is the perfect place for this to be stored on behalf of our country. So I want to thank the other members, Mr. McNerney, Mr. Shimkus, and Ms. Matsui, who are all working on this, and appreciate Chair Chairman Tonko and Chairman Pallone for marking up this legislation. I support this bill and yield back. The gentleman yields back. Thank you, uh, Representative Peters. Are there any other members who seek recognition for an opening statement? The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Matsui for three minutes for an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Finding a solution to managing the disposal of spent nuclear fuel has been a top priority of mine for many years, particularly as my district utility, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, is one of the many across the country forced to continue playing host to this dangerous radioactive material long after they've committed to do so. We all agree that this stalemate is unsustainable. The best and most pragmatic path forward involves a consolidated interim storage program based on a consent-based process. That is why I've introduced the Store Nuclear Fuel Act, which puts forward a plan that has historically garnered broad support. The federal government has gone back on its promise to our constituents. A consolidated interim storage approach will allow the over 120 communities across the country to, develop, to redevelop nuclear re reactor sites that for many have been decommissioned for years, and in my district's case, decades. I am disappointed by the committee's choice today, only bringing up H.R. 2699, a proposal that was the preferred approach last Congress in a Republican-controlled House, but in this Congress, it is not a realistic path forward. H.R. 2699, which is almost identical to a bill I voted in favor of last year, contains provisions for interim stories, something I have long supported. We made progress last year in negotiations when my amendment was incorporated into the Shimkus bill to begin work on a consolidated interim storage pilot. However, it remains clear that the bill last year, and now H.R. 2699, does not represent the most expeditious path to removing spent fuel from our communities. Tying interim storage to a final decision on Yucca Mountain is not, just not realistic. 
I believe there's a path forward for a permanent storage solution. However, this path will require time, creativity, and a significant engagement with affected communities. My bill does not hamper this process in any way. It simply provides a temporary solution to relieve our constituents of nuclear waste right in their communities so that they can fully redevelop these areas and get on with their lives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. We thank Representative Matsui. Are there any other members who seek recognition for an opening statement? The Chair recognizes uh, Representative uh, Dinkle for an opening statement for three minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman Tonko and Republican Leader Shimkus for holding today's subcommittee markup on this critical legislation. Today, we are considering 15 important bills that would truly improve the way of life for every American and the health of, health of our environment. Each deserves our bipartisan support, and while we may still have some differences on them, I'm very hopeful that we can come to agreement before full committee. First, we are considering legislation from my friend Rep. Bonamici to ban asbestos. Asbestos, no matter its form or where it is found, is a clear threat to public health, and it's been for too long. Second, we are marking up a package of bills that will seriously address the growing nationwide threat we face from highly fluorinated chemicals known as PFAS. I strongly support all of these bills and urge that all of us will come together to move them forward to the full committee, including the bill that I've led with my colleague Fred Upton to list PFAS, uh, at, which is hazardous substance under the Superfund Cleanup Program, and legislate legislation to accelerate PFAS cleanups at federal facilities through the use of cooperative agreements with the states. It's incumbent on the Congress to act given the inaction by the administration. The reality is that while everybody acknowledges that this is a dangerous chemical, it's still that we do not have a federal standard. We have only guidelines. EPA has been promising to promulgate a standard every time they come to committee and we don't have it. And Michigan is a state that is finding PFAS in many places because we're testing for it more than any other state. And when other states start testing, you're gonna look like Michigan. It's in our water, it's in our fish, it's in our grounds. We are considering important legislation that would establish a national protective standard for PFAS in drinking water that's enforceable. Legislation from Chairman Pallone that would provide grants to PFAS-affected water systems, legislation to prohibit the manufacture of any new PFAS chemical substances, and legislation to list PFAS as hazardous air pollutants, just to name a few. I really want to thank Chairman Pallone and Chairman Tonko for their strong leadership on PFAS chemicals and for bringing up these bills today. They're, these are harmful chemicals, and they're not affecting Republicans or Democrats, they're affecting all of us. Finally, we're going to consider legislation that our Republican leader Shimkus and Rep. McNair have worked very hard with my colleague Doris Mitsui on improving storage of spent nuclear fuel in a manner that's safe and secure for all future generations of Americans. Thank you for your leadership. I'm proud to support all of these bills, and I hope that this morning we will all support all of these bills. General Lady yields back. We thank Representative Dingo. Are there any other members who seek recognition for opening statements? Hearing none, we, uh, that concludes our opening statements. Pursuant to committee rules, members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Please submit uh, written opening statements to the clerk's desk. At this time, we will begin bill consideration. The chair calls up 1603. The clerk will report the title of the bill, please. H.R. 1603, a bill to amend the Toxic Substances Control Act to prohibit the manufacture, processing, and distribution in commerce of asbestos and asbestos-containing mixtures and articles and for other purposes. Thank you. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Representative Pallone is recognized for uh, as little time as possible. possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 
I want to speak in support of the bill, the Alan Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, and thank the subcommittee chairman for calling it up. Today's mark a busy momentous occasion, the first vote on a bill to ban asbestos in the House of Representatives. And this is an important step forward and one that I believe can lead finally to ending the import and use of asbestos in this country. We've known the dangers of asbestos for decades, but it's still in use and still killing about 40,000 Americans every year. I, it's interesting because I, I, when I go around, a lot of people think it has been banned and they're surprised to find out that it hasn't. So today we are saying enough is enough. This legislation is supported by the Insulators Union, the International Association of Firefighters, the AFL-CAO, the American Public Health Association, and the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. It would ban the ongoing uses of asbestos within one year, require reporting on the asbestos that is still coming into this country, and require a comprehensive report on exposures to legacy asbestos. And I'm proud to be a lead sponsor of this bill, Representative Bonamici and Representative Slotkin. I want to recognize Representative Bonamici in particular for her leadership on this issue, on this issue which stretches back to her time in the Oregon State Legislature. And I thank Senator Merkley for his leadership on the legislation in the Senate. I also want to recognize the tireless advocacy of Linda and Emily Reinstein, whose late husband and father is honored by this bill. My staff and I have been working for several months to negotiate a deal on this legislation that could hopefully allow all of our members on both sides of the aisle to support the bill. And we're close, but not quite finished. So I look forward to continuing that work and continuing to pursue a broad consensus to ban this toxic substance and urge my colleagues to support this bill today as we move forward to full committee. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Shimkus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief, too. Uh, um, Emily and Linda are in the back there. They've been strong advocates. I want to make sure I recognize them. Uh, Chairman Plone's correct, and Chairman Tomko, we are, we are very close. Uh, as I said most of my stuff in the um, opening statement, so I'm not going to belabor it. Uh, we've been trying to make sure that we protect the chlorine producers and the chloralkylide producers because they have a major role in uh, the safety in, in health care and hospitals and, and the like. Um, we think we've got that put to bed, and we think there's a few more cats and dogs, but uh, I'm optimistic we'll get there, and I look forward. I'll be voting no today, but I look forward to voting yes in full committee. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Are there any other members who seek recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes Representative Dinkle for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I'd like to thank my colleague, Representative Suzanne Benamici, for her leadership on banning asbestos, and I'm a proud co-sponsor of H.R. 1603. Asbestos has been in use in the United States since the 19th century, and its risks to human health have been well known for decades. And yet, asbestos-related diseases still kill up to 40,000 Americans per year. This is wrong. Asbestos still exists in older building infrastructure, including schools, in insulation, water pipes, and ceiling and floor tiles. Exposure to asbestos remains significant for American workers across this country, as well as in construction, manufacturing, education, automotive repair, and firefighting. Recently, in my district, we had an issue at a Superfund site where asbestos violations were issued during the remediation, wind blew it all over, and the demolition process of old asbestos panels, coated metal used as metal walls and roofs. The community panicked uh, about what was happening and what, was in the, uh, what could be the impact. We've confirmed, or we've been told, that there was ultimately no serious harm to air quality in this case by the EPA and by EGLE and the state level but it's still very concerning. And also this year, Claire's recalled three products that tested positive for asbestos by the Food and Drug Administration, which is why I've introduced legislation with my colleague, Rep. Jan Schakowsky, so cosmetics marketed to children contain proper warning labels alerting parents of dangerous toxins. Personally, I don't think we should have asbestos in cosmetics being sold to children. No worker, no student, no firefighter, and no child should ever be exposed to harmful asbestos in this day and age. We have the opportunity to change that today. 
The Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act would simply prohibit the manufacture, processing, and distribution in commerce of asbestos and asbestos containing mixtures and articles. Asbestos, no matter its form or where it is found, is a clear threat to public health. Let us not fail one more generation and let us move this bill forward to finally protect America's health once and for all. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this important legislation, and I do urge all of my colleagues to support it. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, we'll then ask if there are any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment. Seeing none, then the question now occurs on favorably forwarding uh, H.R. 1603 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 1603 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 1603 is forwarded to the uh, full committee. At this time, we'll begin. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say something other than? Oh, I correct it. It's H.R. 1603. So uh, thank you, Waverly. At this time, we will begin bill consideration. The uh, chair calls up H.R. 535, and the clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 535, a bill to require the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to designate per and polyfluoroalk substances as hazardous substances under the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Chair recognizes Representative Dingle for uh, five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to speak in support of my legislation. First, I would like to thank this committee for its bipartisan leadership on the issue of PFAS. It's been exactly a year this month since this committee held its first hearing, the first hearing of its kind in the Congress on PFAS, and after the contamination discovery in Parchment, Michigan, my Michigan colleague Fred Upton's district. Since then, the number of sites across Michigan has metastasized to 66 sites and over 700 sites nationwide. We have also identified almost 300 different contamination sites and military bases and facilities. We know these chemicals are harmful to human health and persist in the environment. PFAS chemicals have been linked to liver disease, thyroid dysfunction, and several forms of cancer. Michigan has become ground zero, but it's because we're looking for it and testing for it. Flint water taught Michigan something. But just last week, another study was uh, released, and there were another 90 military sites identified. It is everywhere, and more states are going to find it once they start looking for it. Under our former Republican Governor Snyder, and continued under our current Democratic Governor Whitmer, so bipartisan, nonpartisan, Michigan established MPART, the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team, to test research, identify, recommend, and implement PFAS response actions throughout the state. And I might also add that Governor Snyder had a scientific task force that found that the guideline, not the standard, the guideline may not be stringent enough to protect health. Republican governors uh, task force. But it's a nonpartisan issue. In my district, the rivers, the lakes, and the ponds, and the Huron watershed are still contaminated with PFAS foam washing ashore, and signs are posted to not eat the fish, and we have to tell people not to consume the foam. It's altering our way of life for many in Michigan. Many states are now following Michigan's lead testing for PFAS, 
but we can't adequately serve the American people and safeguard our environment without strong federal leadership. It's been over seven months now since the EPA announced its so-called PFAS action plan. And what's been done? This is all plan and no action from where I sit. In May 2018, then EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt proudly announced that EPA would propose designating PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under the Superfund law. Yet, under EPA Administrator Wheeler's leadership, EPA hasn't even proposed to do it, let alone taken any action. At this rate, it'll be another year, probably longer, before they even take that first step. The PFAS Action Act was the very first bill introduced in the 116th Congress. I was proud to lead this bill with my good friend and Michigan colleague, Fred Upton. The PFAS Action Act would simply require the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency list all PFAS chemicals, including PFOA, PFOS, Gen X, and many other chemicals as hazardous substances under the Superfund cleanup program within a year. It's the single most important bill Congress can pass to jumpstart the cleanup process and direct federal resources to this problem in communities across the country. While we understand there are concerns from a number of stakeholders who are worried about where the liability will ultimately fall with the CERCLA designation, but rest assured, we're committed to working with all the stakeholders and each member on this committee throughout this process to properly address any concerns. I'm confident we can and will come to a bipartisan path forward here because it's too important. Right now, without this bill and with the absence of EPA leadership, the true polluters aren't paying for the PFAS contamination they've caused. This act will change that. It will place responsibility with the polluters, it will unlock resources, and it will speed up cleanup. And the sooner we clean up these contaminated sites, the less contamination there is to be, that we have to treat in our water systems. And until we do this, the local water systems are cleaning up their water. Clear and swift action is needed from Congress at this moment to list PFAS chemicals as a hazardous substance under CERCLA and to protect human health and environment in an expeditious manner. I yield back my two seconds. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Simkis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I'll, I'll be um, brief. I, I never like to get in fights with dingles. Um, I've done it too many times over my career, and, and they're tough, and, and Debbie has, well, again, risen to the challenge, and I know you, you feel very strong about this. Uh, a couple questions that, that we are wrestling with is what I raised in the opening statement is, I mean, we use the term PFAS as a chemical, one chain. And PFAS is anywhere between 102 to 5,000. In fact, we can't find out. We don't really know. So then the debate goes, which ones are safe and which ones are harmful? And then the debate goes, if it's safe, use, as FDA says it is in food containers, then do they fall into the people who are hauling this stuff? Do they get trapped up in the, in the Superfund? And you highlighted that. The, what the cost, uh, joint and severable liability on this. Um, a blanket ban, as I said on the floor, and I know there's some dispute and, and documents go around, it's a de facto ban on all the, how many thousands of formulations there may be out there. Um, I use this on the floor, this is the uh, seal for airplanes. All goes around the, goes around the door and there are things that aren't soluble in water. So if it's not soluble in water, if it's in a municipal landfill, if it can't break down, does that landfill, because it has now a formulation of PFAS now, become a Superfund site? And what about all those people? So um, this is one that I don't think we're gonna get to. Uh, we, will, we will be defeated. <laughs> this will go to the full committee. Uh, this will eventually go to the floor. Uh, we are in great negotiations on a lot of these bills, but unfortunately this is one that uh, I don't see there's a pathway unless we visit, and I know we can. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. 
The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes uh, Chairman Pallone for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word uh, because I want to support um, the Stingles bill. Let's be clear, uh, Superfund is a statute and a program that works. It gets hazardous sites cleaned up and it ensures that polluters pay. It's an essential public health program and an environmental success story. PFAS are contaminating our air, our land, our water, and making us sick. These chemicals are all man-made, and there are solvent, responsible parties that made profits off this pollution. And CERCLA is exactly the statute to address this problem. We're hearing concerns that treating listing PFAS under CERCLA will be problematic, but these chemicals are no different than the other chemical groups already listed. Let me emphasize that, that there are already a large number of chemical groups listed under CERCLA, more than 50 chemical groups according to the June 2019 update. These groups include lead compounds, chromium compounds, dioxin and dioxin-like compounds, chlorinated benzenes, coke, oven emissions, and more. And many or all of these substances are already present in waste streams. They're in our municipal solid waste, they're in biosolids, they're in the waste produced by drinking water treatment plants. For example, arsenic compounds are listed under CERCLA as a group. Water utilities have been treating for arsenic for more than 17 years. And we've not seen concerns about their waste products. Cobalt compounds have been listed under CERCLA, but they're still used in heart stents. Ammonia has long been listed, but airports still use it for de-icing and complying with effluent limits. And asbestos has been listed under CERCLA for decades. Clearly, listing a chemical under CERCLA does not de facto ban it because asbestos is still in use and we're still working on banning it today in the other legislation we already passed. So it seems to me that the groups raising concerns about circular listings are misunderstanding how circular works and how well it works to address environmental contaminants. If members want to see changes in the bill, I'm obviously happy to work with them, and I know uh, my colleague, the sponsor of the bill, Ms. Stingle, is as well. But I just want to stress this is an important bill that will make all the difference for these impacted communities, and so I urge my colleagues to support it as we move the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Duncan for five minutes, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Many of us on both sides of the aisle want to enact laws that will help accelerate work to address the risk of PFAS chemicals and remediate contamination of chemicals shown to be of risk to the health. But blanket classifications that raise the liability and cleanup costs can undermine those efforts. We've heard in the NDAA process and in committee here from a number of organizations over the past few months that underscore this point. For example, here's a letter from AdvaMed, the Advanced Medical Technology Association, which notes, and I quote, medical devices made from fluoropolymers, a compound of PFAS, has been available to patients for 50 years with tens of millions of devices used without demonstrating adverse health effects like carcinogenicity, uh, or reproductive developmental and um, endocrine toxi toxicity. I'm having a tough time today. The health risk of these medical devices are thoroughly assessed by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And it goes on. Are we to place these devices in landfills and then designate them as Superfund sites? Here's another letter to the NDA conferees from Aerospace Industries Association noting restrictions on two particular substances that will have significant ramifications for the continued operation of U.S. civil aviation systems, and we urge conferees to reject the restrictions in the conference. Here's one from the American Association of Airport Executives, which expressed concern that airports have no choice with their firefighting foam, which contains PFAS compounds, and cost liability burdens of designating all PFAS as hazardous substances under the Superfund. We heard that in the subcommittee hearing. Or how about the coalition letter that everyone has at their chair from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, and a number of state-level chambers and manufacturing associations, Airlines for America, American Coatings Association, American Forest and Paper Association, various en energy industries, manufacturing and chemical-related industries, asking that we not take action that circumvents existing regulatory authorities and regulate all PFAS as a single class. This will not work. Finally, how about the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies letter to this subcommittee's leaders? This letter encourages our oversight of EPA to implement its regulatory determinations and warns against hasty formulation of standards. 
It notes, for example, that following the Safe Drinking Water Act's transparent and science-based science -based regulatory process will lead to the most trusted outcome for communities and for the public. We should keep that in mind when we consider this bill or many others that we're marking up today. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The Chair recognizes Representative Carter for five minutes, please. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. I just want to start by saying it's unfortunate that we're in a position in which there isn't unanimous support to address PFAS. We know that there are certain PFAS substances that need to be addressed because of adverse health effects, especially in things like drinking water. But the approach taken by this bill raises some concerns I think we should be discussing. For instance, I have reservations regarding the impact this bill will have on commercial and civilian airports. As you know, firefighting foams to help suppress aircraft fires are unique due to the extreme conditions that can come about as a result of an aircraft fire. Under current law, airports must comply with Section 139, Title 14, under the Code of Federal Regulations, which requires them to use aqueous film-forming foam, which contains PFAS substances. While the FAA bill passed last year requires the approval of a PFAS-free alternative within three years, it is my understanding that there aren't any available which share the same suppressant characteristics as those that are currently on the market. I have several airports in my district, including the Savannah Hilton Head International Airport. It's unique in that they are also the tenant for two Department of Defense installations with the Department of Defense firefighting units servicing the airport. My concern lies with knowing the safety implications of putting a firefighting foam out in the public that isn't as effective as what's currently being used. If someone has a loved one on an aircraft that is on fire, we all want what will be the most effective in keeping the people on board safe. If this bill moves forward as written, it could have serious implications for the airports and could put them in a position in which complying with one part of federal law requires them to be in violation of another. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to repeat that because this is the most important point here. If this bill moves forward as written, it could have serious implications for the airports and could put them in a position in which complying with one part of federal law requires them to be in violation of another. They, these aren't hazardous polluters. These are the airports that help service our communities and keep people traveling for business, to see their families and friends, or maybe to go off to a trip of a lifetime. Either way, we need to keep in mind that these airports are just trying to be in compliance with federal laws. I appreciate what my colleagues are trying to do in preventing further contamination or harm. I truly do. I understand what you're trying to do. But this is a complicated and difficult chemical class to work through. We can continue to work together on suggestions and ways to address PFAS contamination, but moving through CERCLA and its declarations can cause some peripheral issues that could have effects down the line. I hope I can continue to work with my friends on both sides of the aisle and keeping people safe, but I don't want to see these potential impacts arise from entities like airports. We must keep all of this in mind as we work towards legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The uh, gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking to speak to the uh, underlying bill? The chair recognizes uh, the ranker of the uh, full committee, Representative Walden, for five I, minutes. I'd like to strike the requisite number of words. I, I know that many members of the subcommittee, and, and for that member in the Congress, would like to see cleanup occur at sites contaminated with PFAS. We all want that. I understand the motivation of the gentlelady from Michigan and her passion on this and, and many other issues and with this legislation, uh, is to have a forcing mechanism to make the Defense Department clean up sites where it has caused the contamination, but is dragging its feet on doing any kind of cleanup. I get that. My other colleagues have already touched on some of the extremely concerning consequences of this legislation, especially that CERCLA does not permit a surgical carve-out of those who innocently use the hazardous substance and leads to forever liability under the law. This is pretty big stuff you're doing here. And you're Congress is interceding in what should be a decision based on science. The EPA is actually following the law passed by Congress requiring science-based evaluations and decisions. This legislation would step all over science and just make a political determination. And I don't think that's the right approach here. 
Um, I, I want to observe two things. First, the National Defense Authorization Act that passed in both the House and the Senate contained language requiring the federal government to enter into cooperative agreements with states concerning cleanup of PFAS, and those agreements would bind the federal government to meet either state or federal standards, whichever is lower. In addition, the national defense bills contain language obligating the Defense Department to clean up items that are not hazardous substances but less serious items such as pollutants or contaminants. This likely means DOD cleanup of PFAS one way or another. Okay? It's really important. In addition, the Environmental Protection Agency has other authorities it could use, and I'm thinking of the very robust legal authority under Section 1431 of the Safe Drinking Water Act to take any action, including the provision of alternate sources of drinking water when a contaminant may, may, that's, that's in the law, endanger drinking water sources. Generally, this authority is supposed to be used when the state is not acted, but as was shown in Flint, Michigan, concerning lead contamination in drinking water, EPA has exercised this authority when they believed an endangerment existed, irrespective of what others were doing. So they have that authority and they have used it. I'm afraid no matter how well intentioned a circle of designation might be to help communities across our nation get cleaned up, and we all want that, going this direction may create more problems on the back end that we could avoid with other authorities. So whether we like it or not, according to EPA, PFAS are used to make electronic and communications products like information cables, our iPhones, there's PFAS in this, there's PFAS in cars, all kinds of parts, uh, in, in automobiles, uh, x-ray film, artificial body parts, life-saving body armor for our military and first responders like Kevlar, and in automobile manufacturing, as I said. So before we just do a blanket uh, decision here without science behind it that will affect uh, an incredible, maybe hundreds if not thousands of different uh, derivatives of this, um, we, we need to base our decision on, on science, not, not emotion, and we need to get this right so we have the impact we want and not have these huge unintended consequences. So for the reasons, as well as those articulated by some of my other co colleagues, I find I must oppose H.R. 535 in its present form. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes Representative Peters for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield my time. I'll yield time uh, now to the distinguished representative from Michigan, Ms. Dingell. Thank you, Mr. Peters. I want to respond to my colleague, Mr. Carter, who I always love working with. Uh, we know that there's some airport legitimate issues. I mean, I've spent a lot of time out there with our firefighters, and you know, when we have a tanker fire on I-94, it's the same as what's at the airports. But I think we've also got to encourage the development of something that's going to work as effectively. So we are op we want to sit down and talk about the airports because that is a. But having said that, if not now, when they've been promising us, promising us uh, a standard for since I've been in Congress uh, that they were going to set a standard, and they haven't even promulgated a rulemaking yet on that. And we know. I mean, we know if you talk to some of the employees at the companies that were producing this substance, they have unbelievable levels of PFAS in their blood. And the companies knew it and didn't do anything. So we can't keep waiting to do something. And we can all work together to do it right, but we've got a crisis. And Will if the general let yield? Certainly. For a question. You said in your opening statement about this bill that the Congress has had one hearing recently in the history of Congress on PFAS. Did I hear that correctly? Here we are marking up a bill. Do you think we've had enough hearings on this subject well, I said in order to move forward on a hearing. piece of legislation? I said we've had the first hearing. Government Ops has been doing, and I learned a lot, Government Operations has done three hearings. And all the manufacturers, uh, it was a very interesting hearing. Three of the manufacturers of PFAS were at the hearing. One of the manufacturers actually supports this being listed on CERCLA. Other companies admitted to knowing back in the 70s that they were finding it in their employees' bloodstream. I just think it might be prudent to adjourn debate on this bill and have more hearings. I yield back. Thank you. So I just wanted to make the point we're open on that, but I do think the time is now. Would generally yield? 
So you're asking us to vote on a bill um, to, to put them all under CERCLA, basically. What scientific background is there on these individual cases? You, know, you would be surprised to add the amount of scientific that? data. We can put it into the record. I don't have it sitting because here. Because my, my understanding is that's the work under the law that the EPA is conducting right now with their scientists, is to go through and try and determine from a scientific standpoint which one should be covered, which shouldn't. That's not easy. It, does, it takes time to get it right. And we're going to trump that process with your bill and just say they all need to be put under CERCLA and banned. And, and of course, some of the PFAS companies may like that because then they can use the law to go sue others to pay for it. cleanups. We, we want to get this stuff, we want to get this legislation right. That's all we're saying. People are being poisoned right now. They don't know what's in their water. So, so what's your replacement for auto parts, for, for We've got to encourage for... other substances, but how do we know that people who are talking on the iPhone when PFAS is in it aren't, you know, we've seen studies. We know it's a dangerous, it's we, a hazardous. Well, there are lots of things in the world that are dangerous and hazardous. The question is, they ride, which ones rise to a point of a human health hazard? We know PFAS rise to a human health hazard. In every single and case. And I will provide the data that we in, have in seen. Every, in every case. single case. We can go through the data that has every, been provided. But, but your bill says every PFAS, single PFAS, well, right? the PFAS that's in water, that's in fish, that... I got that. ...is but, a danger. That's what we need to clean up. All right, but every, all 5,000, you believe, are, are a EPA human health can acid. work that through once it's listed. But, but EPA but is The Defense Department is using... Scientific we know that the t military bases are poisoned. We know... You have five of them in your district. They but need to be cleaned up. The Defense Department will not clean them up because it is not listed under and, CERCLA. And we're working that through NDAA, right? And so we're trying to get to that. There's no dispute that. So you support cleaning those sites up? Well, of course. Who doesn't, right? But, but how your, are we going to get that your done? bill goes way beyond, beyond that, right? Your bill goes to all 5,000 of these uh, derivatives and lumps them all the same way. That's all we're saying here is what's the science? Are, are, I got it, you want to do that without the basis of science behind that. I understand that. I think um, there is science and we should put it for the record and I hope between subcommittee I, and full committee we can Please have provide a it discussion. on each one of the 5,000 because that's the work EPA is undertaking by law and without political And at their normal speed of doing anything? Without, without political interference. My time has expired, I yield back. There are any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Um, seeing none, the, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? And seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding HR 535 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 535 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the H.R. 535 is forwarded to the full committee. At this time, we will begin uh, bill consideration. Uh, the chair calls up H.R. 2377. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2377, a bill to amend the Safe Drinking Water Act to require the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to publish a maximum contaminant level goal and promulgate a national primary drinking water regulation for total per and polyfluoroalk substances and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill now is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Mr. Chairman, I... The uh, chair recognizes uh, Representative Barragan for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish to strike the last word. Um, I want to thank you, Chairman Tonko, and my colleagues who have worked tirelessly to address the PFAS contamination in water systems across the United States. 
Access to clean water is a fundamental right for all Americans, regardless of the zip code that they live in. Just yesterday, the Environmental Working Group discovered that water sources for 74 community water systems in the state of California are contaminated with PFAS chemicals, including water systems in my district. As everyone on this committee knows, these forever chemicals are linked to an increased risk of cancer, reproductive and immune system harm, liver or thyroid disease, and other health problems. I'm proud this committee is acting on this issue that affects the livelihoods of all Americans. I'm hopeful that these bills um, coming out of this committee will address issues presented by PFAS like water remediation, consumer protection, and incineration. And with that, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Chair. Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. The uh, chair recognizes Representative Shimkus for five minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, and I'll, again, a brief. The, uh, the bill requires EPA to set one drinking water maximum contaminant level, MCL, for all PFAS. So here's, we're in that debate again about if there's 5,000 formulations, we're going to have, we're going to mandate through law that the EPA do maximum contaminant limits on formulations that may be safe. Um, so we know PFO and PFOS are health risk. So we, we have it up. It's not a problem with us directing those. But again, to throw the whole net over this whole universe, um, even though there is little or no information about all but a handful of hundreds of chemicals in the class, and that you'll hear that from us quite a bit about banning an entire class versus targeting specific formulations that we know are harmful. We want to move and use science um, and due diligence. And the problem is this is an emotional issue, and it, science takes time. Even in today's with new technology and generational studies, it takes longer than, than we would like. I'm just going to read a statement from... Uh, uh, Joseph Cortruvo, uh, Dr. Cortruvo, he was the first director of the EPA's Drinking Water Standards Division after the passage of the Safe Drinking Water Act and was instrumental in developing of most existing drinking water standards and regulatory policies and also is the introduction of the EPA Drinking Water Health Advisories. And he says this. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good article, but in the paragraph I'm going to read is, we need consistent expert mainstream and scientifically credible drinking water quality benchmarks to send the message that science and risk assessment are objective and restore the public's confidence in regulators. EPA has the lead national responsibility. Uh, I think it, the key is EPA, and, and this is on PFAS, this is on the, what we're talking about today. Um, it's, he says EPA has a lead national responsibility. He does not say the Congress of the United States has the lead responsibility. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any, any other members seeking uh, recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Representative Flores for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I, I agree with the other comments that have been uh, expressed here today. We all want... Uh, some formulations of PFAS and PFO, uh, we understand that some of those are toxic. However, the subcommittee doesn't have sufficient scientific or factual information to make sound policy decisions at this point. Uh, this bill requires EPA to set one drinking water maximum contaminant level for all PFAS to protect public health. Even though there's little or no information about all but a handful of the hundreds of chemicals in this class, this is not a science-based, risk-informed approach to chemical safety. This bill calls for a rulemaking that undermines the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, basis in sound identification and risk regulation. The foundational aspects of current law ensure that levels set in this act are based on sound, sound scientific rationale, peer review, or data and public participation. This bill doesn't pretend to care about a deliberate, thoughtful scientific pr process. Rather, it prioritizes haste and would put enormous pressure on the EPA to take shortcuts for the sake of setting a broad new regulation which is not based on scientific analysis. 
Additionally, the rushed analysis mandated in this legislation would potentially undermine public confidence in the EPA's decisions and result in the imposition of potentially unnecessary cost on public water systems. States and public water systems would be required to implement the total PFAS drinking water regulations produced under this bill. This bill is too broad, would mandate expensive control technologies that would not result in any benefits to public health. It would be very expensive for anyone who pays their monthly water bill, and it would divert resources away from other efforts to ensure that our drinking water is safe. Look, I reiterate where I started, and that is we all want to make sure that our water is clean and safe. However, we need to be cautious about the policy pendulum swinging so far that it does more harm than benefit to hardworking American families. So this is not the way to legislate uh, chemical safety requirements, and I urge a no vote on H.R. 2377. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members uh, seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? If not, I will recognize myself uh, to strike the last word and speak on the measure for five minutes. I rise in support of the Protect Drinking Water from PFAS Act of 2019, led by my good friend, Representative Boyle of Pennsylvania. I'm proud to have been an original co-sponsor of this legislation in this Congress and previous, uh, in the previous Congress. This bill would require EPA to set a drinking water standard for total PFAS within two years. By focusing on total PFAS as opposed to a small subset, the bill will ensure that all communities impacted by PFAS contamination can have access to reliable and safe drinking water. If your community is impacted by PFOS, you will be protected. If your community is impacted by Gen X, you will be protected. I also want to stress how important the deadline is in this bill, because EPA has shown so little interest in regulating PFAS and so little ability to address any contaminants under the Safe water, Drinking Water Act. Since the adoption of the Safe Drinking Water Act amendments of 1996, the EPA has not managed to use the standard setting process laid out in those amendments. The one chemical for which they have tried, perchlorate, the process has dragged on for more than 10 years. And when EPA announced their PFAS action plan, they pledged only to make a regulatory determination for two PFAS by the end of the year. They did not take a position on how that regulatory determination uh, would come out. So I think it is clear that EPA will not act without a deadline. I do want to raise one potential concern with the bill, which is one that we have heard at the hearing and have continued to hear since. Because of problems in the Safe Drinking Water Act, setting a deadline for a standard may not be enough to ensure that a health protective standard is set. I think it is essential as legislation on PFAS moves forward that we ensure any drinking water standard set at the national level is protective of public health, including the health of vulnerable subpopulations. I hope that we can work together to address that issue and any concerns my colleagues might raise as we move this bill forward. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and yield back the balance of my time. With that, are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Hearing none, are there any other uh, members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding uh, H.R. 2377 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2377 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 2377 is forwarded to the full committee. At this time, we will begin bill consideration. The chair calls up H.R. 2566. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2566 a bill to require the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to revise the safe, Safer Choice Standard to provide for a Safer Choice label for pots, pans, and cooking utensils that do not contain PFAS and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of this bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered 
as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes Representative Soto for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman Tonko and Ranking Member Simkis for the opportunity to testify before the Environment and Climate Change Subcommittee on our bill, H.R. 2566. This is a voluntary label program, voluntary. And so this will allow us to be able to distinguish cook cookware that is PFAS free. It's clear from everything we've discussed today that we need to address PFAS contamination from every angle. We should be working to stop the flow of these chemicals into our environment and our bodies. But government action can be slow. And I'm hearing from my constituents that people want to know what they can do to protect themselves. Unfortunately, there is a lot of information available for consumers to make informed choices and avoid PFAS. There's not a lot of information to avoid PFAS exposure from the products they buy, whether it is PFAS generally or PFOA or PFAS, we are hearing about more today. That's why I've introduced HR 2566 to require the EPA to establish this voluntary label for cookware that is PFAS free. The EPA Safer Choice program already provides this voluntary label for consumers looking to choose safer dish soaps, laundry products, car care products, and more. I believe expanding the Safer Choice program to cover PFAS free cookware will provide consumers with an important new tool. These are things that all of our families use, and uh, we can help keep Americans uh, informed and safe. And I thank you all uh, in advance for your consideration of this legislation. I look forward to working with you, Chairman, and our ranking member, Shimkus, as 2566 moves forward in the committee process. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Johnson for uh, Mr. Chairman, minutes. I move to strike the last word. Uh, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the opportunity to speak. I, and uh, I appreciate uh, Mr. Soto, uh, my colleague, offering this. I, I actually believe this is a well-meaning bill, but it presents a few technical challenges as it's currently drafted. Uh, if Mr. Soto and the majority will commit to working with us, I'm hopeful we can come to a bipartisan agreement on this bill. Uh, the bill appears to require the EPA to establish a voluntary label for cookware that is PFAS free under EPA Safer Choice Program. Uh, the challenge is that the Safer Choice Program was never intended to apply to pots and pans and cooking utensils. Safer Choice was really designed to cover cleaning agents, detergents, and personal care items rather than finished goods such as cooking utensils. If we're going to open the Safer Choice program to cookware, we really need to take, a more, uh, take more time to understand how the program works and how to overcome the technical challenges. The first step could be for the EPA to conduct a feasibility study. I also believe they should consult with the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Protection Safety Commission to ensure any labeling standards are clear and consistent. Finally, I, I believe we should allow for rigorous scientific review of PFAS and its use in cooking equipment with a focus on the well-characterized compounds PFOA and PFOS. We will commit to working on these issues before the full committee, and I'm hopeful we can find a path forward for a bipartisan agreement. So, Reiterating, if, if Mr. Soto and, and the majority will commit to working with us, I think we can find a path forward, and I thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Representative Blunt Rochester is recognized for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yes, we are willing to work with you on this bill, this important bill. General Lady yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2566 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2566 to the full committee, 
will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2566 is forwarded to the full committee. At this time, we will begin bill consideration. The chair calls up H.R. 2570. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2570, a bill to ensure that polluters pay ongoing water treatment costs associated with contamination from perfluoroalk and polyfluoroalk substances and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of this bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Okay. Nobody here. The uh, chair now recognizes Representative Johnson for uh, five thank, minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, I move to strike the last word. I, I think we all want to enact laws that will help accelerate work to address the risk of PFAS chemicals and remediate contamination of chemicals shown to be of risk to health. And while this bill appears to offer a well-meaning approach to, to generate revenue to address PFAS contamination, I cannot support it. H.R. 2570 establishes a trust fund financed through user fees from PFAS manufacturers to pay ongoing operations and maintenance costs of water treatment works and drinking water treatment plants that remove PFAS. Understand, this bill creates an indiscriminate blanket tax on manufacturers regardless of toxicity of the particular PFAS substances they may be producing or using. This is not an appropriate way to apply user fees. In addition, this bill goes beyond merely cleaning up the contamination. It pays for the operation and maintenance or the o &M costs of affected utilities. Even if you accept the premise Congress should do this, the EPA does not presently have, nor does the agency require reporting of, information on baseline o &M costs for drinking water and wastewater facilities. In fact, EPA's drinking water and wastewater infrastructure funding programs, including those administered by our state partners, by design provide subsidies for capital investment and not O&M. These programs have never been eligible. So, this is not an appropriate approach to raising funds and I'm concerned that it's too expensive in its scope and application, and I therefore, Mr. Chairman, urge a no vote on H.R. 2570, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2570 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2570 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 2570 is forwarded to the full committee. At this time, we begin another bill consideration. The chair calls up H.R. 2533. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2533, a bill to, ass <clears throat> to assist commun community water systems affected by PFAS contamination and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Chair recognizes uh, Chairman Pallone for five minutes, please. I want to thank Chairman Tonko for calling up the bill and working on this legislation, the Providing Financial Assistance for Safe Drinking Water Act. This bill amends the Safe Drinking Water Act to create a new grant program to speed resources to water systems facing a crisis of PFAS contamination. 
The EPA has been dragging its feet on PFAS, but drinking water utilities are not waiting for federal action to start treating their water. They're responding to their customers and to state standards now, and they're facing uncertainty and steep costs as they do so. My bill would assist these water utilities in two ways. First, by requiring the EPA to evaluate what technologies are effective to remove PFAS from drinking water. And second, by providing funding to purchase and install those effective technologies. And from everything we've seen so far, the technologies that will effectively remove PFAS are very costly. And as more evidence comes out showing how widespread this contamination is, it's become clear the resources currently available through the state revolving fund will not be sufficient to address this along with the other pressing drinking water infrastructure challenges. A recent study by the Environmental Working Group found that PFAS chemicals at 43 water systems and utilities serving over 3 million New Jersey residents that they had PFAS. And nationally, the study found 610 sites contaminated in 43 states affecting the water resources or water sources of about 19 million people in the United States. So we can see how widespread this problem is and that of course creates a lot more costs for local government. And as the scope of this problem continues to grow and water systems nationwide, they're just gonna need a lot of funding. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Shimkus for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate what uh, Chairman Pallone is trying to accomplish with this legislation, a non-regulatory response to aid systems burdened by the cost of expensive equipment to aid in PFAS treatment. This bill is an effort to tackle what concern many communities have regarding the purity of their water. This was a point made by our witness from Ann Arbor, Michigan, about the expense their facility incurred in upgrading their equipment to treat PFAS in their drinking water. I believe he mentioned that for his system, the cost was about $1 million. Unfortunately, the overall bill is not something I can support in its current form. I will be happy to work with the, the chairman between now and full committee to, to address our concerns in a way that hopefully we can support it. Specifically, I'm concerned about how the grant program will be administered by EPA and the process and infrastructure needed to stand up this program. I know there might be challenges, but I feel like using the infrastructure of the existing and successful drinking water state loan fund represents an opportunity avoid, to avoid us from reinventing the wheel and permits those closer to the action to decide where the money should go. I'm also concerned about the scope of what this bill captures when it targets equipment treating, and I quote, all detectable PFAS. During this mean, does this mean that the equipment treats those PFAS that can be detected using the validated method, or is it something much broader? As my colleague, Mr. McKinley says on this issue, we need to chase the right rabbit. I'm also concerned about the number of years and authorization amount contained in this bill. I realize this is just an authorization, but we should not send conflicting signals to the House Appropriator uh, which, about which drinking water programs are a priority with the limited funding available. Whether this means making it a pilot program, knocking down the authorization level quite a bit or both, I think we should have that conversation. I know people are anxious to address these contaminants, but we must do our due diligence and use sound and objective science reviews to right size the response to the problem we are facing. We should not guess on a chemical if it is not well characterized. I really do believe the chairman is on to a good solution um, and I believe that we can get there and I hope we will work through the time between now and the sub, the sub and the full to, to uh, get to a better understanding and agreement. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to uh, speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2533 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2533 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2533 is forwarded to the uh, full committee. 
The chair now calls up H.R. 2577, and the clerk will report the uh, bill, please. H.R. 2577, a bill to amend the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act of 1986 to include per and polyfluoroalk substances on the toxics release inventory and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The uh, bill is now considered as read. And without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes Representative Duncan for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have moved to strike the last word. While this may sound like a good idea, this bill would effectively flood the TRI list, which is the Toxic Release Inventory List, which is meant for non-dangerous chemicals. It would flood it with PFAS compounds regardless of whether science and toxicology say anything about the safety of those chemicals. It would also require any business to report the releases of these chemicals, again, regardless of whether they are safe or not. And there will be no opportunity to delist the chemicals if they are found to be safe. Let me add that this bill lo lowers the threshold for reporting releases of PFAS chemicals, whether safe or not, to 1,000 pounds, which is 90% less than the current statutory reporting threshold. Now, this is not the way to regulate and certainly not the way to convey to the public accurate risk information. 2577 also undermines a well-developed science-based regulatory process for determining which chemicals should be listed on the TRI. This bill would add unnecessary burdens to businesses and does not advance sound science, responsible regulation, or effective risk communication. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on H.R. 2577. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members uh, seeking to speak on the underlying bill? Uh, seeing none, the chair will recognize himself for five minutes, uh, moving to strike the last word. I want to uh, support H.R. 2577, the PFAS Right to Know Act, sponsored by Representative Delgado of New York. Community right to know is such an important principle in environmental protection especially on an issue like PFAS, where the public concern is so high. This bill amends the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act to include total PFAS on the Toxics Release Inventory, or TRI. This will require covered industries to report their releases of PFAS chemicals in a clear way to the general public and provide important information to regulators and researchers. This bill takes a critical step forward to give impacted communities access to information about the PFAS contamination in their neighborhoods. Arming communities with information to protect themselves should be something we can all support. Communities deserve to have access to information in an easy to understand form to better plan for the health and safety of their families. Importantly, TRI reporting also has a track record of reducing pollution. When industries track their releases and have to admit to them, there is an incentive to reduce or, in fact, eliminate those releases. So I do believe this bill will drive down releases of dangerous chemicals. The bill also minimizes reporting burdens for regulated industry by focusing on one test and one total metric for PFAS. I want to mention one change we would like to see in the bill going forward, and that is a change brought to my attention by the bill's sponsor, Representative Delgado. In the time since the bill was introduced, Representative Delgado has heard from constituents and stakeholders that the reporting threshold in the bill should be lowered to get a complete picture of these releases. I hope we can work to make that change as the bill moves forward. The public's right to know is of the utmost importance to me, and I am proud to vote in favor of this bill. I urge my colleagues to do the same. With that, I yield back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2577 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2577 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> HR. Help him out, gang. Help him out. HR. <laughs> H.R. 2577 is forwarded to the full committee. <laughs> they didn't show up for rehearsal. The chair now calls up H.R. 2591. The clerk will report the bill. Please. H.R. 2591, a bill to, pro to prohibit the waste incineration of per and polyfluoral alk substances and for other purposes. We appreciate the, uh, the clerk uh, having these tongue twisters to uh, read all morning. So um, without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with, and the bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for an amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? The chair recognizes Representative Shimkus for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this one, I think we can get to. Um, let me just talk about my concerns. Uh, the bill amends the Solid Waste Disposal Act to prohibit the incineration disposal of firefighting foam containing per and polyfluoroalkali substances. So if you can't incinerate it, what do you do with it? You put it in a landfill. I don't, uh, our issue will be Let's allow incineration, but let's make sure it's done based upon standards that protect the airs. Uh, and we do have, if you've never visited a toxic incinerator, I have one close to my district, you should do it. They burn it very hot and very clean, and they have standards uh, that they have to meet. So hopefully this is one we can work on, and we can add that to the robust number of ones we're trying to get to. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. If the gentleman would just yield. For I a would moment. yield. Um, we look forward to working with you on this measure. We think it's very important to uh, uh, our constituencies across the country. And um, hearing that you're willing to work on this, I'm hopeful that we can come to some resolve. Good. That um, the gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2591 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2591 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. 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 <laughs> in, the, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. H.R. 2591 is forwarded to the full committee. The chair now calls up H.R. 2596. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2596, a bill to amend the Toxic Substances Control Act with respect to manufacturing and processing notices for per and polyfluoral substances and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Mr. Chairman. Right, 2596. The chair recognizes Representative Dingle for five minutes, please. Uh, I move to speak in uh, support of this bill on behalf of my colleague, uh, Ms. Custer. H.R. 2596, introduced by our colleague, Ms. Custer, would take an important step to stop the flow of PFAS contamination into our environment and our products. This simple bill would say, we have plenty of PFAS chemicals, enough is enough. According to EPA, there are roughly 600 PFAS chemicals actively being manufactured in the United States at this time. I actually think it's more, but we'll use EPA statistics. From past EPA estimates, we know there are more than 4,000 additional PFAS that have previously been introduced into commerce, but are not currently being used. We don't need more. We have seen since the phase out of PFOA and PFOS, PFOS, that this injury has made small changes to substitute new PFAS whose health effects are no less concerning. 
These regrettable substitutions will continue so long as we allow new PFAS with minor modifications onto the market. This is an especially pressing concern given information received by the, this committee this year that EPA is continuing to allow new PFAS onto the market without review under exemptions for, from the new chemicals program. Innovation should be driving us away from these dangerous forever chemicals towards alternatives that are truly safer. This bill will point innovation in that direc direction while still providing industry with thousands of PFAS to use. I support my colleague's bill, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. The gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members who seek recognition uh, to, offer, to speak on the underlying bill? Mr. Chair, Chairman, I move the record. Chair recognizes Representative Flores for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, uh, we all are aware that some formulations of PFAS are toxic. However, the, formula, the uh, substance uh, does not have, or this uh, legislation and this subcommittee don't have sufficient scientific and factual information to make sound policy decisions in this regard at this time. This bill amends Section 5 of the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TOSCA, to prevent the introduction of any new PFAS into commerce. New chemistries are often designed to replace older and potentially more toxic chemistries. This bill would disincentivize innovation and production of new chemicals, which may replace existing chemicals in commerce. This bill would ban any such new chemistries involving PFAS. That kind of statutory ban and predetermination of unreasonable risk for an entire class of chemicals is out of step with the congressional intent expressed in the Laudenberg Amendments to TOSCA, which requires that the EPA evaluate chemical risk and take risk management action when unreasonable risk is identified. The current standard in TOSCA for market access of new chemicals is that a new chemical or a new use of a chemical must not likely be uh, must not likely be to present an unreasonable risk to health or the environment without any consideration of cost or other non-risk factors, including an unreasonable risk to vulnerable and susceptible populations. If it doesn't meet that test, it is restricted in some way. This bill treats that extremely tough standard and likely raises it to a totally unattainable standard. Moreover, regardless of the hazard or risk profile of the PFAS, most of us, uh, this committee doesn't have sufficient information about, the bill unscientifically predetermines that all new PFAS present an unreasonable risk of injury or health to the environment, when in actuality, a new PFAS could be developed as safe. Like several of the other bills on today's markup, this legislation would circumvent existing statutory authorities on chemical regulation. We need to hear from the EPA on the record on this legislation, uh, and we need to maximize the existing statutory and regulatory authorities that currently exist. It was less than four years ago that we overhauled TOSCA, and we did that in a bipartisan way and with adherence to the tenets of strong science and reliable data. Let's not abandon these efforts for this kind of overreaching legislation. Look, we all want to work together to have a clean environment and to uh, to find a, a way to regulate PFAS in a, in a responsible manner. I hope that we can work together uh, to, to make this bill better. Uh, we need to be cautious, however, about letting the policy pendulum spring so far that we get no benefit and we actually hurt hardworking American families. And so with that, I urge a no vote on H.R. 2596. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2596 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2596 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and H.R. 2596 is forwarded to the full committee. The uh, chair now calls up H.R. 2600. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2600, a bill to regulate per and polyfluoral uh, substances, un <clears throat> excuse me, under the Toxic Substances Control Act and for other purposes. 
Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. And without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Duncan for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. <clears throat> H.R. 2600 bans the manufacture, processing, and distribution of all new and existing PFAS, which could mean hundreds of chemical compounds, implications of which are not even fully understood. This is not the way to address chemical risk. It could actually harm public health and safety. H.R. 2600 bypasses all statutory requirements in Section 6 of the Toxic Substance Control Act, including the science-based review for determination is made. Imposing statutory ban of an entire class of chemicals flies in the face of the risk and science-based policy enshrined in a multiple, a multitude of environmental and public health laws implemented by EPA. There are 602 active PFAS chemicals on the inventory, so this would have a potentially large impact on a significant number of entities and products. And it's unclear if alternatives are even available or if potential alternatives are more protective of human health or the environment. Implementation of this legislation could be highly disruptive to quality health care, emergency response, and national defense, including cardiac medical devices and Kevlar for police and military. It would remove an alternative to asbestos and mercury and chlorine production, just as we're moving legislation to ban asbestos. This is not the way to address chemical risk, and this bill could actually do more harm to the public health and safety. It's not clear how its disposal requirements would work with other bills being considered today. And this is not science-based. It's not risk-based. And it's not the way to implement chemical safety laws. So I urge opposition 2600. And with that, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Chair recognizes Representative Pallone for five minutes, please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of the bills discussed today take critical long overdue action to clean up PFAS contamination and protect our communities from ongoing risks associated with PFAS exposure. H.R. 2600 puts many of these pieces together in a comprehensive package under, under TSCA. This section is modeled after the PCB provisions adopted on the floor of the House when TSCA was enacted in 1976. Those provisions authored by the great John Dingell were really the only part of the original TSCA that ever worked. And these provisions are a good model, I think, for multifaceted action on PFAS. Like PFAS, PCBs are known to cause a wide range of adverse health effects, including cancer and damage to the immune, reproductive, nervous, and endocrine systems. And like PFAS, they are a persistent problem. Even with the comprehensive action taken in 1976, we're still working to address PCB contamination today. So to me, that shows that we can't wait to take similar action on PFAS. This bill would stop the introduction of new PFAS, phase out the production of existing PFAS, and set standards for disposal and labeling. And it would represent strong, decisive action. So I support the bill, and I urge my colleagues to do the same and I yield back at this time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2600 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2600 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. All right. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. H.R. 2600 is forwarded to the full committee. The chair now calls up H.R. 2605. The clerk will report the bill, please. Oops. H.R. 2605. A bill to direct the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue a final rule adding as a class all perfluoroalk and polyfluoroalk substances with at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom to the list of hazardous air pollutants under Section 112B of the Clean Air Act, 42 U.S. Code, 7412B, and for other purposes. 
Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Um, are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Um, I seeing none on my side, I will just recognize myself for five minutes. We need to be conscious of how people are exposed from PFAS. We all know drinking water is a concern, but air also deserves our attention. Congresswoman Stevens introduced this bill to direct the EPA administrator to issue a rule adding PFAS to the list of hazardous air pollutants under Section 112B of the Clean Air Act. Within six months, the administrator must issue a final rule making this addition, and within one year, the administration should revise the listing to include categories and subcategories of major sources. I have heard concerns from residents in Hoosick Falls, New York, near my district, about PFAS exposure coming from air pollution. Their drinking water is being filtered and remediated, but industrial sources are still emitting PFAS unabated. That is not right. Even EPA acknowledged the need for a comprehensive approach to PFAS. It cut across statutes and EPA offices. It cuts across statutes and EPA offices. We cannot stop at the Safe Drinking Water Act. Air pollution is an exposure pathway that we need to give a lot more attention, and we have tools under the Clean Air Act. Today, EPA regulates some 187 hazardous air pollutants. National emissions standards for hazardous air pollutants limit the release of specified pollutants from specific industrial sectors. I want to note that these standards are technology-based. EPA would determine the best available control technology and consider cost when setting emissions limits. With that, I encourage members to support this bill, and I yield back and uh, recognize Representative Long for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. This bill directs the EPA to add all PFAS to the list of hazardous air pollutants under Section 112B of the Clean Air Act. It also requires the EPA to revise the list of air pollution sources to include categories and subcategories of major sources and area sources of the, P, of the PFAS substances. This bill is not driven by science or data. We will not have had the opportunity to hear from the EPA on the record regarding this bill. We understand that the agency does not have the needed information or sufficient studies to determine that all PFAS substances, which could be as many as 5,000, demonstrate a threat of adverse human health effects or adverse environmental effects is required by the Clean Air Act listing for HAPS. There is an existing statutory process under the Clean Air Act for listing substances as, as hazardous air pollutants under the Act. That process, and not a congressional substance by substance mandate, should be the course we follow. In addition to the lack of scientific analysis and the lack of studies regarding PFAS as hazardous air pollutants, the timelines in H.R. 2605 for the rulemakings that would be required here and for the list of source categories are unrealistic unworkable, and invitations for litigation. In addition, making PFAS a hazardous air pollutant also, by, by default, makes it a circular hazardous substance, and we've already gone over the problems of that happening. As my colleagues have stressed regarding some of the other bills on today's markup, this is not the way to regulate chemicals. We have environmental statutes in place. Let's let them work. I urge a no vote on H.R. 2605, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2605 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2605 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2605 is forwarded to the full committee. The chair now calls up H.R. 2608, and the clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2608, a bill to require the testing of perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoral alk substances under the Toxic Substances Control Act and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. 
The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Um, I shall recognize myself for five minutes. We have heard about the need to characterize PFAS separately, that they should not all be assumed to be harmful. Mr. Maloney's bill would help enable that approach by requiring toxicity testing of all PFAS under the Toxic Substance Control Act. This will allow for proper characterization of substances, and we will be able to better understand the range of risk and toxicity associated with this large group of chemicals, as well as the potential health, safety, envir and environmental impacts of each substance. This is an important step to inform regulatory action under other statutes, and I think it is what was envisioned during the efforts to reform TSCA. This is what a capable chemical safety office at EPA could and should be doing. I thank Congress Member Maloney, who has been fighting on behalf of people dealing with PFAS contamination in Newburgh, New York, for introducing this bill. I hope my colleagues will support it, and at the very least, I hope we can continue working to reach bipartisan agreement on moving forward. And with that, I yield back and then recognize uh, the ranker of the subcommittee, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we've talked before, this is one that I have um, great interest in. I think it's in, it's in keeping with stated positions, not only in, in private, but in committee and on the floor. One of the things I have been struck by during the hearing on this subject and the debate we're having today on PFAS responses is how little all of us really know about the toxicity of the entire class of PFAS. EPA admits that it lacks lots of health effects data on PFAS, and when I listen to folks talk about it, they say how some of these substances are linked to certain diseases. As I rudimentally understand it, the phrasing is code for, we don't know enough to say for sure that disease will happen, but we don't want to be wrong either. This is one of the places where I wish we had EPA to testify before us so we could really dig into the science and what is truly known about PFAS. In the absence of that, many times I hear some projecting one chemical for another when the truth is not all PFAS look alike or act alike. I worry this creates solutions without improper responses to actual problems we face. While I've been surprised that EPA under, but, um, under uh, Presidents Obama and Trump have not been more aggressive in using its information collection authority, unfortunately, I cannot support this bill in its current form. I would like to work with you, Mr. Chairman, to approve this bill in a way that makes sense. H.R. 2608 calls for comprehensive toxicity testing for PFAS under TSCA, yet TSCA does not legally require a standard set of test data for all chemistries and forbids it for existing chemicals. In addition, comprehensive toxicity testing for each PFAS may be overkill for what is needed. There needs to be limits on requiring duplicate testing or creating information when EPA is already aware of the answer. I understand it will take too long to test PFAS one by one, but I also stand that there is a promise in the idea of grouping PFAS by subclass to at least help EPA narrow down the areas where real concerns should be focused. I also understand that some of the timelines in, in the legislation might be challenging to meet in view of other administrative requirements to carry out this legislation. I would like to work with you, Mr. Chairman, the agency, the manufacturers, and others to improve this product into something that makes sense, improves our scientific understanding of PFAS, and doesn't tie the agency or stakeholders up in knots trying to comply. I hope this offer is something you're interested in pursuing. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2608 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2608 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 2608 is forwarded to the full committee. The chair now calls up H.R. 2626. The clerk will report the bill, please. 
H.R. 2626, a bill to, <clears throat> to encourage federal agencies to expeditiously enter into or amend cooperative agreements with states for removal or remedial action to address PFAS contamination in drinking surface and groundwater and land surface and subsurface strata and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. We'll move to seek recognition to speak on the underlying bill. I'll recognize myself for five minutes. I move to strike the last word and want to thank Mr. Upton and Ms. Dingle for their work on this bill. We know the difficulties many communities and states have had trying to hold federal polluters, especially DOD facilities, accountable. That is uh, unacceptable. If the federal government was responsible for these releases, we should not hide from our responsibility or our liability to address the problems. Entering into cooperative agreements with states to ensure remediation occurs to an acceptable a standard is incredibly important. I support this bill, but I want to offer one additional thought for my Republican colleagues that may support this bill but have concerns with Ms. Dinkle's CERCLA bill. I am proud to represent a part of Rensselaer County. And just over the congressional district line uh, of the 20th congressional district is the village of Hoosick Falls. I have spoken about the struggles this community has dealt with, and I think we can all agree they deserve to have their water and their land remediated. In their case, the PFAS pollution came from an industrial source, not a federal facility, which is not covered by this bill. That is why we need a broader approach to cleanups. This bill is not going to help every community in need of federal support. I know there are concerns with the CERCLA hazardous substance designation and Mr. Rauda's cleanup trust fund proposal, but I want to make certain that we are looking for and uh, looking at all aspects of cleanup and holding polluters accountable, regardless if it is a federal or a private entity. I hope we can support Mr. Upton's bill today, but continue to discuss what steps can be taken to give communities like Hoosick Falls the ability to achieve the cleanups necessary by recognizing the approach taken by Ms. Dinkle. With that, I yield back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Uh, Representative Walden is recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I support this bill. It's introduced by uh, my good friend and former chairman of this committee, Fred Upton, and my friend from Michigan, Ms. Dingle. This legislation responds to very important issues concerning um, perfluoroalkali per and uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, first, the legislation drives federal government, particularly the Defense Department, to enter into the cooperative agreements with the states about cleaning up the PFAS contamination for which it is responsible. These agreements will, legally, uh, are, will be legally binding and will address the cleanup all of us have wanted from the Defense Department. So we're in agreement there. Second, it will not allow the federal government to avoid state standards when it comes to cleanup. Specifically, this legislation requires the federal government to clean up PFAS, the lower of the federal or state standards for a specific PFAS contamination. Third, this legislation allows the federal government to contract with states, Indian tribes, and water utilities to perform PFAS cleanup of ground and surface water. So I know this bill will help in states such as Michigan that are taking their own steps to regulate PFAS. It may not be the broad cleanup forcing mechanism that some of my colleagues would like to see, but it is real, it is focused, it is achievable, and it will make a difference. This bill is the kind of bipartisan work I talked about in my opening statement that's bipartisan, practical, and common sense. So I urge uh, my colleagues to support H.R. 2626, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, are there any other members seeking recognition to um speak uh, on the underlying bill. The chair recognizes Representative Dingle for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I would like to say a few quick words on this bill since my colleagues who helped lead this effort are not members of this subcommittee. I always love it when Mr. Upton and Mr. Walden and I are on the same page. And we try to be there most of the time. We need an all-hands-on-deck response to the growing PFAS contamination in Michigan and nationwide. It will take all of us, local, state, and federal governments, to identify and clean up these contaminated sites. 
I am proud to lead H.R. 2626, the PFAS Accountability Act, with Mr. Upton and the rest of my Michigan colleagues. This bipartisan legislation will help states such as Michigan respond quickly when contamination is detected at federal facilities. This bill simply requires federal agencies to enter into cooperative agreements with states to accelerate the cleanup process where PFAS contamination is detected at these facilities, such as active or former military installations, National Guard facilities, or other federal facilities. The federal government would need to file state and federal laws from which they are currently exempt for PFAS cleanup around their facilities. The bill will facilitate testing, monitoring, removal, and remediation when these chemicals are detected in water and soil. And federal agencies would be required to come up with a plan of action with affected states within one year of a request from the state. This legislation will play a critical role in the cleanup process and help bring everyone together. I really do want to thank Chairman Pallone, Chairman Tonko, the Republican leaders, Walden and Shimkus, and your staff for working on this bill with this. I hope every member will vote for this, and I think they will with Mr. Walden and Mr. Upton leading. You know, we may seem obsessed with it in Michigan, but they're starting to test in other states. This is a crisis in 50 states across the country, and we have to do something about it. it it's just a real crisis. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members uh, seeking Mr. recognition? Chairman? to speak on the underlying bill. Move to strike the last word. Uh, Representative Rogers is recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Madam, or Mr. Chairman. Like others have shared, my community also has been impacted by PFOS contamination. In 2017, testing of a water system at Airway Heights, in Airway Heights, Washington, which is in my district, revealed PFO and PFOS levels higher than the EPA's health advisory levels. This contamination was caused by firefighting foam used at nearby Fairchild Air Force Base. Since discovering the, the contamination, the base has worked closely with the community on cleaning and mitigating the effects of the chemicals on the water supply, which was declared safe to drink after swift action to flush, flush and filter the contaminated water. However, there's more work to be done to ensure the continued safety of the Airway Heights community. We still have unanswered questions. This bill, introduced by Mr. Upton and Mrs. Dingle, will be a significant step toward ensuring incidences like airway heights are adequately addressed in the future. First, it would direct federal agencies responsible for contamination, particularly the Department of Defense, to enter into cooperative agreements with the states to clean up PFOS. These agreements will be legally binding and will ensure the Defense Department addresses the cleanup. It would also prevent the federal government from avoiding state standards when it comes to cleanup. Specifically, this legislation requires the federal government to clean up PFOS to the level of the federal or state standard for that specific PFOS contamination. Finally, it would allow the federal government to contract with states, Indian tribes, and water utilities to perform PFOS cleanup of ground and surface waters. I commend Mr. Upton and Mrs. Dingle for their leadership on this important issue. This bill is a significant step towards ensuring the long-term cleanup of airway heights and other communities affected by contamination from federal facilities. I urge my colleagues to support the bill and yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2626 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2626 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2626 is forwarded to the full committee. Chair now calls up H.R. 2638. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2638, a bill to direct the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue guidance on minimizing the use of firefighting foam containing PFAS and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill is now considered as read. 
Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill from our side? I see none. I will recognize myself for five minutes. This bill, introduced by Congress Member Fletcher, responds to a real need to keep firefighters and other first responders safe from PFAS. Just like asbestos, we know these jobs face additional risks from toxic exposure. In this case, through the use of firefighting foams containing PFAS. This issue was brought to the forefront during the Intercontinental Terminals Company plant fire in Deer Park, Texas earlier this year. Responding to that event, firefighters used more than 130,000 gallons of foam to extinguish the flames. Since then, high levels of PFAS were found in the water of the Houston Ship Channel. This bill directs the EPA administrator within one year to issue guidance on minimizing the use of foams and other firefighting materials containing PFAS and to minimize firefighters' health risk from PFAS exposure. I have even heard concerns that their turnout gear contains PFAS. I believe we can help provide more information to our first responders on ways to reduce both their potential exposure and release into the environment without sacrificing their ability to respond to events and respond effectively. This is a common sense approach to protect the people on the front lines, fighting dangerous chemical fires, handling PFAS foams and other PFAS coated equipment. I urge members to support this bill. And I yield back. Chair now recognizes uh, Member Mr. Rogers yep. for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill requires EPA to issue guidance for firefighters and other first responders to minimize the use of foam and other firefighting materials containing PFAS and to minimize their health at risk for PFAS exposure. I agree with the intent of the bill. The issue that we've had in Airway Heights stemming from firefighting foam used by Fairchild Air Force Base contain PFOA and PFAS. I believe that we should work to mitig mitigate the risk before similar contamination can happen for other communities. However, I have a few concerns with the current approach. For one, I'm not sure if EPA is the appropriate federal agency to issue guidance on the use of firefighting foam. It's also unclear how EPA would implement this provision and whether it would conflict with existing guidance issued by a separate federal agency. If the majority is willing, I would like to work with the EPA, work with the EPA to gather more information and try to solve some of these implementation challenges so we can ensure our communities are effectively protected. We should also have EPA work with the U.S. Fire Administration to better understand their role and ensure that they consult with EPA to avoid conflicting guidance. Lastly, I want to be sure the definition of PFOS in the bill gets at those substances where known or sub suspected adverse health consequences were at risk. Rather than unnecessarily applying to thousands of types of chemicals, most of all, those that have poorly understood risk profiles. I hope we can get a commitment to working on these issues between now and the full committee. If so, I'm hopeful that we can find bipartisan agreement on this bill and help avoid future situations. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. Let me share with Representative Rogers that we're most willing to work with you to come to a resolve on the issue. Um, are there any other members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? And again, seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2638 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2638 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And H.R. 2638 is forwarded to the full committee. Okay, the chair now calls up what I believe is our last bill, H.R. 2699. The clerk will report the bill, please. H.R. 2699, a bill to amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill will be dispensed with. The bill now is now considered as read. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Are there any members seeking recognition to speak on the underlying bill? 
The uh, chair recognizes Representative McNerney for five minutes, please. Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. The ranking member, Mr. Shimkus, and I introduced H.R. 2699 because we believe the issue of nuclear waste is important and urgent. I also want to thank Mr. Peters, Ms. Blunt Rochester, and Mr. Duncan for co sponsoring this bill. Our country has a dangerous buildup of inadequately secured nuclear waste. This hazardous logjam puts communities at risk and inhibits our ability to integrate nuclear power into a robust emissions reducing agenda to combat, combat the impending threats of climate change. The nexus between federal, state, and local authority and the link between interim storage and permanent storage must be thought of as hand in hand, and we believe that our bill does strike the right balance. Specifically, our bill ensures that the DOE has adequate funding to construct and operate a multi-generational infrastructure project that would assist in the resolution of pending permanent repository license, which will help determine if the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste site in Nevada can be licensed and constructed. This bill also directs the Department of Energy to move forward with a temporary storage program to consolidate spent nuclear fuel from sites with a decommissioned reactor while work on a permanent repository progressive, prioritizing the transfer of spent fuel from seismically active areas to interim sites. Our bill also provides for community consent, enabling the state of Nevada and other local stakeholders the opportunity to engage with the federal government as a host for the permanent repository. This bill also protects our national security priorities by providing the most expeditious pathway to removing defense waste from DOD and DOE sites. If we are to address the climate crisis with the urgency that it requires, it is imperative that we act to resolve the nuclear waste issue. As a graduate student, I conducted calculations and developed theory on the Southern New Mexico WIP site, fault tree analysis. My conclusion at the time was that nuclear waste has engineering solutions, but the real challenge is political and social. How do you convince people in a democratic society to establish a permanent nuclear waste repository in their region? France does it, Sweden does it, but the U.S. has not been able to get it done, despite the growing urgency of the problem. The quandary is now that it's hard enough to get any local community to agree to establish temporary storage, but without the promise of permanent repository, the challenge becomes that much more difficult. On the other hand, members from the proposed permanent repository state will fight tooth and nail, so we have a stalemate. This bill has broad bipartisan support. It's a good solution to the stalemate, and it gives everyone a say. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Walden for five minutes, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I move strike the last word. As I mentioned earlier, um, this bill seeks to preserve the important system for permanent disposal established in the underlying bill while allowing flexibility of interim storage, a compromise we reached in the last Congress and I think was really important. Plain fact is this represents the best path forward for getting the nation to a safety, safety licensing decision which is necessary for the public understanding of the science and engineering behind the Yucca site and for confidence in our nuclear waste program. It reflects careful consideration of the framework for a successful policy. It will assure that any interim storage initiative does not supplant the need for a permanent repository or divert resources away from finishing the NRC's view of the pending Yucca Mountain license. Moving forward with the Yucca Mountain program remains the most expeditious path to start removing nuclear waste from DOE sites like Hanford, uh, which is just across the river from my district in Washington State. We've invested $15 billion thus far in the project, and the path to answering Nevada's questions about the safety and suitability of the site's well established. The bill makes sure this course is followed. Members on both sides of the aisle want to break the logjam that's harmed our nation's fiscal health and national security. 
I really want to appreciate everybody that's involved in this and thank you for your continued efforts and to the chairman of both the sub and full committees for moving this bill forward and certainly Mr. Shimkus. We, uh, I was out there on a bipartisan uh, trip to Yucca and uh, all you have to do is, is go out there and see it for yourself and the investment there is amazing, the science is behind it and uh, we need to move forward for the safety of the country and for the, the financial sanity for ratepayers and taxpayers alike. So with that, um, I would, do you want me to yield to Mr. Duncan? No, we'll, we'll call on him. You'll call on him, okay. Then I would yield back the balance of my time okay. and encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting this. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Dingle for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. There is no easy solution to nuclear waste storage or disposal, but we've got to work together in a bipartisan manner with all the stakeholders to do what will be best for this country and all Americans' long-term health and safety. Members of Congress are sent here to solve the tough problems. It's our duty and our responsibility. Congress has been confounded by this issue for too long, over 30 years. So it's time we move forward with legislation that will seriously address stored nuclear fuel. The stakes are just simply too high. We know that spent nuclear fuel can be hazardous if not stored properly. As many have already stated, this waste is currently just sitting at active and decommissioned nuclear plants all across the country, including Michigan. This practice is costly and it presents a security risk as spent fuel simply sits in pools and on concrete pads at sites that were never designed to hold it this long. Instead of requiring these sites to hold this material while a permanent repository is licensed and constructed, we should begin moving it to more appropriate consolidated interim storage sites. Last Congress, I supported this Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act which included a sense of Congress amendment Mr. Upton and I led that said the governments of the United States and Canada should not allow permanent or long-term storage of spent nuclear fuel or other radioactive waste near the Great Lakes or in the Great Lakes. We think this was an important provision for protecting the Great Lakes region and we look forward to working with the committee to offer it again during the full committee markup process. I thank Rep. Shimkus and Rep. McNary for their leadership on this bill. I look forward to continuing to work with each of you as this bill moves forward, and I yield back the rest of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair recognizes Representative Duncan for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I want to thank the gentlelady from Michigan for her words. It's rare that uh, she and I agree on a lot of stuff when it comes to a lot of these issues, so I thank you for your comments. And I want to thank the chairman for including H.R. 2699, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2019, in today's markup. I've been a long supporter of establishing Yucca Mountain as the nation's permanent geological repository for nuclear waste. I've been out there. I stood on top of the mountain. I said, if we can't put the nuclear waste of the nation here, we can't put it anywhere. It's the law of the land to store spent fuel at Yucca Mountain. Nuclear waste currently sits in 121 of our communities in 39 states. The issue of spent nuclear fuel is a priority for me. My state's a leader in nuclear energy. South Carolina is home to seven reactors at four locations. Now, the question I, I pose is would we rather continue to have nuclear waste sitting on the shores of Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, the Savannah River, the Catawba River, um, Kiwi Key, uh, Lake Kiwi. It sits on waterways at nuclear sites around the country. Or would you rather have it go to a site that was chosen after a lot of immense study and picked as the long-term repository and that is Yucca Mountain. Now, the sites in South Carolina store nearly 5,000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel from commercial reactors. But in addition to the commercial waste, the Department of Energy's Savannah River site stores about 8,000 tons of vitrified nuclear waste from defense production, along with about 35 million gallons of high-level waste, including interest, South Carolina ratepayers, not taxpayers, 
But South Carolina ratepayers have paid over $3 billion to the DOE's nuclear waste fund to permanently dispose of this used fuel, fuel at Yucca Mountain. That's for construction and operation of Yucca Mountain. It's the third most of any state in the country. That's why it's important to me. We need to make Yucca Mountain a reality. This bill ensures the structure is in place to license a permanent geological repository. This bill does address and provide for interim storage, but links it to a permanent repository. I welcome interim storage options and help more quickly to remove the fuel from shutdown sites, but that has to be part of an integrated solution that's linked to a permanent geological repository. That's Yucca Mountain, and this bill does just that. I, I thank the gentleman from California for his leadership on this. Nuclear energy is a critical part of our energy matrix and has significantly helped us reduce our emissions as a nation. And unfortunately, the lack of a durable used fuel program is giving the U.S. nuclear industry a black eye. Seventy percent of all reactors currently under construction are from Russia and China. Those two countries, who are also our adversaries in a lot of ways, are positioning themselves to take the leading role in establishing global nuclear norms. If we're to maintain our competitiveness in the global nuclear arena, continue to incentivize investments in the industry, it's imperative that we as a nation establish an integrated waste system and a permanent repository. I remind you again that it is the law of the land that we store spent fuel at Yucca Mountain. H.R. 2699 would advance the goal for that, and I urge all my colleagues to support it. I want to see this bill make it out of committee. I want to see this bill on the floor of the House of Representatives voted out, and I challenge the United States Senate to take this bill up. I applaud Mr. Shimkus, Mr. McNerney, and with that, I urge my colleagues to support it, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Ranking Member Shimkus for five minutes. Great, thank you, um, um, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate my colleagues. I, I actually appreciate, I wanna make uh, sure I mention uh, Congressman McNerney, who's um, smart, articulate, and has been a good partner, and I appreciate him leading this effort in this Congress. Um, it's not easy, as we're finding out, to go against the uh, uh, really personalities and politics versus public poli good public policy. So I, I do wanna call him out on that. Uh, uh, Congressman Duncan's a, a great articulate um, spokesman and I'm glad he's on this team. Um, he brings the passion that I once brought. <laughs> so, so I think we'll be fine <laughs> for a while. Um, and a couple points. First of all, what we're trying to do is f comply with the law. I mean, our challenges has been in the past. The law is passed. The, they're, and, and, and members, over, over time, we lose focus of what's really going on here. The federal government has not been complying with the law. Uh, the buildup continues. Uh, we have acceded to say there is a, the interim is an important piece of that, and I, I do applaud my colleague Doris Matsui for helping us get to there in the last Congress, and we really want to work with her to... Uh, to continue to move forward and, and bring her into uh, part of the team. Uh, let, me, let me talk about the concern on the interim only proposal, and that is it takes money out of the nuclear waste fund. So it, it, it would almost like it will starve the financial process of getting to a long-term repository. Everyone around the world has identified long-term geological repository as a place for the final resting place. Um, can we move and consolidate as we, as we get to a final repository? The answer is yes, and we look forward to, to working with people because that is part of the solution. We wanna get there. Uh, again, let me also thank um, Subcommittee Chair Tonko and, and really Chairman um, Frank Pallone. Um, he's doing something very courageous here and, and I recognize that, and I am personally thankful. So with that, I will uh, yield back my time. The uh, gentleman yields back. Are there any other members seeking uh, recognition to speak on the underlying bill? Seeing none, are there any members who seek recognition to offer an amendment? No. Seeing none, the question now occurs on favorably forwarding H.R. 2699 to the full committee. All those in favor of forwarding H.R. 2699 to the full committee will signify by saying aye. Aye. 
All those in, uh, opposed will signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and H.R. 2699 is forwarded to the full committee. Um, without objection, the staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the bills consistent with the actions taken by the subcommittee here this morning. Um, if, and uh, I don't believe we have any other documents to introduce. With that, the subcommittee now stands adjourned.